Today we are talking about Hampi. Actually, Hampi was known as Vijayanagara, the city of victory in what is now northern Karnataka. Quite simply, this is one of the most spectacular ruined cities of India. Indeed, it is the earliest and most completely preserved Hindu imperial city that we have in this country. For those of you who have been to Hampi, you will never forget the experience. And this is partly because of the landscape. But before we discuss the setting, let's have a quick review of the history. What is the story of Hampi? A very extraordinary story. At the end of the 13th century, Peninsula India was invaded by the troops of the Delhi Sultans. They extinguished all the local Hindu kings that had ruled this part of India at that time. And they established their own kingdom. However, within 20, 30 years, they couldn't hold on to this part of India, and therefore they had to retreat, leaving what we would call today a power vacuum. And in this power vacuum, various things happened that were quite exceptional. Among them, were a group of brothers called Sangama. The Sangamas managed to seize control of the Tungabhadra Valley region of what is now central Karnataka. And within 20, 30 years, they had brought all of southern India under their control, creating a kingdom that assumed the dimensions of an empire because it went all the way down to Tamil Nadu and almost as far across as Kerala. At the same time, kingdoms of Muslim rebels had also been established to the north by the Bahmanis at Gulbarga and Bida. And we have these two simultaneous polities, one Muslim, one Hindu, coexisting uneasily, but nonetheless managing somehow together to survive for more than 200 years. And so this is the history of the city of victory. You may ask, why is this site known as Hampi today. The Vijayanagara city of victory encompassed a large territory, almost 25 square kilometers, including a village known as Hampi. Hampi was a tirtha, a sacred place on the bank of the Tungabhadra River. And it went back to earlier times, at least to the 8th or the 9th centuries. And here, Pampa, a local goddess, was worshipped she gave her name to Hampi. The legend of Hampi is that Pampa was a beautiful maiden, she was very devout, and she attracted Shiva. She seduced Shiva. Shiva came down and was betrothed to her. And she became Parvati, the goddess of Shiva, and he, meanwhile, became the lord of Pampa, Pampa Pati which is the name by which he's known today. And this cult of Pampa and Pampapati, also known as Virupaksha, continues to this day. This is the legend of Hampi. It is the, I would say, mythological underpinning of the place Hampi. Now, when you visit Hampi today, you will notice that it is situated in the wildest, most inhospitable granite landscape with great boulders everywhere. And you will think, how is it that a city was established here? How could they have chosen such a place? And there are various explanations. The first one is that this was a landscape charged with mythological meaning. I've already mentioned Hampi, Pampa, and Virupaksha. So it had this meaning. But the landscape of Hampi, the Tungabhadra River Valley, is also charged with associations with the Ramayana. This, in fact, according to legend, is local Kishkinda. Those of you who are familiar with the Ramayana will know about the Kishkinda chapter of the Ramayana. After Rama's wife, Sita, was abducted by Ravana, Rama and his brother went searching for her, and they came to the monkey kingdom of Kishkinda, where they encountered Sugriva, and they helped Sugriva get back his rightful monkey throne, and Sugriva offered his monkey general, Hanuman, to help them. 
and Hanuman went off to Lanka and found Sita. And all these episodes of the Kishkinda chapter of the Ramayana are locally believed to have taken place in the landscape of Hampi. And today, pilgrims still come to Hampi, not to marvel at the ruins of the great city that was built and then abandoned here, but to visit the various spots in the landscape that are associated with the Ramayana. And so there is a cave where Sita, um, her jewels that Sita dropped when she was flying through the air were hidden by Sugriva. And Sugriva shows this cave and the jewels to Rama and says, this is where Sita passed when she was abducted. There are various mountain tops where um, Rama and his brother Lakshmana waited while Hanuman went off to search for, um, for Sita. And there is also Chakra Tirtha, a point where the Tungabhadra River makes an auspicious turn to the north where people are bathing. And there is a shrine here, and this marks the spot where Lakshmana, Rama's brother, crowns Sugriva as the rightful king of Kishkinda. These and other spots in the landscape imbue the setting of Hampi with mythological meaning. Further reinforcements of these meanings are seen in the boulders scattered throughout the site which are carved with Hanuman, with Rama, even with Lingas, all sorts of topics to do with the legends of the area are in the landscape itself. So this is one of the meanings of the setting of Vijayanagara, the city. Another is the natural protection that these rocky hills gave to the kings. Because they were in aggression with the Muslim neighbors to the north, also fearful of invasion and sieges, they needed protection. And so the city was conceived as a walled citadel benefiting from the rocks and boulders that the landscape offered in this wild granitic landscape. So it was a natural protection that they exploited by building walls up and over the boulders that surround the site. Another benefit of the landscape which is extremely important is that of water. We are in one of the most arid parts of the Deccan Plateau. And if it was not for the Tungabhadra River, it would not be possible for a city to have grown up in this area. As the river Tungabhadra flows across the site, it loses height. That is, it slowly descends. And this provides opportunities to run off water channels at different levels. And these water channels then conduct the water into the fields permitting irrigation. It's an ingenious scheme that exploits the landscape. And this scheme is still in operation today. And the lush landscape of the Humpy area, in contrast to the arid wilderness all around, is very striking. So this agricultural system that was being exploited, that exploited the rivers, allowed crops to be grown and populations to be fed. So we have mythology, we have natural protection, and we have the irrigation water system fed by the river. And these are among the three reasons why Hampi was selected as a site. The fourth reason, which is also very important, is that the Sangamas, this set of brothers who were the first kings of Vijayanagara, were local people. Their father was a Mr. Sangama, and he had been a local chief in the area when the Muslim troops arrived. After Sangama died, his sons, the brothers, Hakka and Bukha, they founded a city that they called the City of Victory. And as I already mentioned, within 20, 30 years, they had brought all of southern India under their control. Their descendants, known as the Sangama dynasty, ruled over South India until the end of the 15th century. The throne was then usurped by the Salova commander, and then 20 years by another commander, the Tulava commander, and we have the third dynasty of rulers of Vijayanagara. And they were in control in the first half of the 16th century. And under the Tulavas at this time, 
the city of Vijayanagara and the kingdom of Vijayanagara reached its apex of influence and wealth. Sadashiva was one of the rulers in the middle of the 16th century, but his throne was taken by a commander called Rama Raya. And this Rama Raya became the effective ruler of the city and the kingdom. But he antagonized his Muslim neighbors to such an extent that they formed a confederacy. And so Bijapur, Golconda, Ahmadnaga, these were the different kingdoms at the time, they all ganged up and created a, an army of their combined troops. And it was this army that then challenged Ramaraya's army in 1565 at the very famous battle of Talikota. Talikota was a site about a hundred kilometers away from Hampi and at this battle in January of that year the Vijayanagara forces were completely defeated. Ramaraya was killed and the king and the court at Hampi fled southwards leaving the city abandoned, undefended. When the troops of Golconda, of Bijapur, of Amanaga arrived at Hampi, the city was undefended and they embarked upon an orgy of destruction. And the city was completely burnt, sacked and then abandoned and never again occupied. So it is a unique and tragic catastrophe that befell Hampi Vijayanagara but also, from an archaeological point of view, extremely interesting because after 1565 there was, in actuality, no further construction to any extent. The later kings of Vijayanagara ruled from places in what is now southern Andhra Pradesh and their kingdom was much diminished. They never really attempted to go back to Hampi to re-establish the city. So we have a chronology from the middle of the 14th century to the middle of the 16th century, a roughly 200 period span. It was created under exceptional circumstances of invasion and catastrophe when the troops of the Delhi Sultans arrived and it was destroyed and abandoned in another set of catastrophic circumstances. In between one of the greatest cities in Asia was created as a showpiece of imperial magnificence. And the money that funded the great city came from all of southern India because the Vijayanagara kings, the Sangamas, the Sulavas and the Tulavas, they brought all of the resources of what is now Andhra, Tamil Nadu and, and all of Karnataka into the capital. They milked all of southern India and they brought all of the wealth to create this great city. From an archaeological point of view the city offers very fascinating opportunities because unlike other imperial cities in India we have a full range of architecture. It's not that we just have temples like say the Chola capital of Tanjore or the Hoysala capital at Halibid. Here we have military architecture we have walls, we have gates, we have lookouts, we have watchtowers. We have courtly architecture, we have the remains of palaces, we have the remains of pleasure pavilions, we have the remains of stables and stores, barracks, all sorts of structures concerned with the governance of the city and of the kingdom. Then, of course, we have religious architecture. We have great temples built to different Hindu deities, Shiva, Vishnu. We have Jain temples. We even have some mosques and tombs because Muslims were also welcome at the capital. This was a cosmopolitan place where people from all over southern India, the Deccan, and even from outside India were welcomed. The Vijayanagara kings were intent upon becoming universal rulers. They wanted to govern the whole world as they understood it. And people from different parts of India and even from beyond were welcome. And the architecture reflects all these different influences. Let's start with the plan of the city. 
The central part of the city occupies no less than 25 square kilometers. It's a colossal, grand, imperial scale. It is not a planned city in the usually understood sense. It is not laid out on a geometric, regular plan. It is divided into different zones, and these zones are wedged into the landscape. The core of the city is what we call the urban core, and this is contained within a complete ring of fortification walls. And these walls run up and over the rocky ridges, so they are highly irregular. They go like this, depending on the ridges. Where the ground is more level, they run in a more straight line. And they create a roughly elliptical zone, five kilometers along the southwest to northeast axis. And in this zone, the bulk of the city's population lived. Sadly, the, most of these houses were built of ephemeral materials, that is, mud brick, bamboo and thatch, and have altogether been washed away. But we have shrines and temples, the occasional mosque in the Muslim quarter, and we have the military architecture. We have the outer walls with bastions, which are great protective towers, and we have the great defensive gateways by which you entered the city. And these gateways give us ideas of the roads leading into the city. And in the middle of the urban core, we have another zone, which we call the royal center. And this is the place where the Vijayanagara emperors, their nobles, and their private household lived and worked. And it is in this zone, in the royal center, that we have what remains of the palaces, the pleasure pavilions, and the stables that I have already mentioned. Now, outside the urban core and the royal center, we have a stretch of land which we call the Irrigated Valley. And through the Irrigated Valley runs a tributary of the Tungabhadra River. We have no evidence of construction in this part of the city. We have no pottery fragments. It, there seems to have never been any building activity here. But what we have are the water channels, the hydraulic systems that I have already mentioned before. It seems that here many of the crops were grown that supported and sustained the population of the city. And indeed, to this day, crops are still growing here. You will see banana groves and sugarcane. Further to the north, we have what we call the sacred city, center of the city. And this consists of a number of discrete units, sometimes referred to as puras, or little towns, each concentrating on a major temple. And the sacred center wraps around the Tungabhadra River itself in the very rugged part of the site. Now the Hampi village, the nucleus, the original historical origins of Vijayanagara, are found here. Also, temples dating to Balakrishna, Tiruvengalanath, another name for Venkateshvara, and Vitala, these great temple complexes, they're all found here, and each of these is the nucleus of a Pura. We have Vitala Pura, we have Achuta Pura, we have Krishna Pura, and we have Hampi. And each of these Puras consists of a great walled temple, inside which are various shrines, and, and other places to worship, entered through a towered gateway. And in South India, we call this towered gateway a gopura. And this has a pyramidal brick and plaster tower supported on a granite substructure. And leading up to this tower from the outside, we have a great colonnaded street. And these streets are very wide. They were stone paved. And along these streets, chariot festivals were held, because these were the chief ceremonies of the temple calendar. And to this day in Hampi, these chariot festivals still take place, marking the betrothal and marriage of Virupaksha and Pampa. But the chariot festivals that took place at the Balakrishna temple, at the Tiruvengalanata temple, and the Vitala temple, they no longer take place because these temples were damaged when the city was ransacked and destroyed, 
and the temples today are only monuments. No worship takes place. Once upon a time, these puras, these temple centers of what we call the sacred center, must have had living populations because there are great bathing tanks, there are great wells, there are rest houses, and there are storerooms and places to worship. They must have had residential priestly populations and supported by the kings, as well as visitors and pilgrims at special occasions. And we also notice that many of these temples intrude into irrigated lands. They seem to be built very close to agricultural zones. When we read the inscriptions on the temples, we find there's lots of information about managing land and crops. So many hectares of dry land, so many hectares of wetland, so many incomes from this village or that village. So the economic system that supported the temple was connected to the economic system of agriculture. This is hardly surprising when we remember that the Vijayanagara kings, the army, the nobles, were away from the capital for many, many months in the year. They went on pilgrimages to temples in their territories. They fought wars against their neighbors. They also fought wars, or let's say they had to go and keep their subordinates in order. So they were away from the capital for maybe three quarters of the year So who was managing the land while they were away? It was the temples. So this is the interesting aspect of religious architecture and religious life of the city. It was also connected with the economic life of the city. So this is the basic arrangement of the town. Around the city there are what we call suburban settlements, satellite villages and towns where other parts of the population lived. These suburban settlements survive today as growing villages and towns and they run along the highways leading into Vijayanagara. And here there are also temples and wells and tanks and these suburban settlements Kamalapur, Kadirampur and Hospet which is where the nearest railway station is located These have lived on into the present day as growing population centers and with the mining industry that has grown up now in the Hospet area, they are flourishing. So this maybe gives you an idea of the zonal urban landscape of Hampi. 25 square kilometers for the main part of the city But if you add the suburban settlements and the outlying areas, many of which have parts of fortifications and reservoirs, great tanks to trap the rainwater that fed the hydraulic system, you are getting an area of perhaps 125 kilometers, a colossal area. No city in India in ancient times spread over such a large area. Now a little bit about the history of research at Hampi Vijayanagara. This was a very poor, I would say neglected area of India. While everybody knew about the history of Vijayanagara, very few people went there to see what was left. It was an abandoned, desolate part of the country. There was lots of malaria, and in the 19th century, wild beasts roamed through the city. Even so, some of the earliest photography in India took place at Hampi. And once we started work, we discovered 60 photographs taken in 1856, which is one of the very earliest dates of photography in this country, even anywhere in the world, by a local British colonel who went there and was amazed at the ruins and took these photographs. And these were only discovered in the 1980s. Towards the end of the 19th century, the archaeological authorities in India started to take an interest in the ruins, they started to protect them, and through the 1920s and 1930s, the buildings started to be restored. But even so, when we began working, me and my colleagues and the volunteer students that we had, mostly architecture students from Indian schools and even from Australia, UK and the US, there was no proper map of the city. 
So our task was to map and measure the ruins. Our Indian colleagues from the ASI, the Archaeological Survey in India, and also from the Karnataka Department of Archaeology, they were responsible for clearing the ruins and excavating and unearthing the ruins that lay beneath the earth. So there were these two campaigns, the excavations, digging beneath the earth, and those of us who, who co-directed together, I worked with an American archaeologist called John Fretz, we co-directed an international team of young people mapping and measuring. And our work continued through the 1980s and through the 1990s for about 21 years. And we have published extensively on the site, and John Fritz is still working on his archaeological atlas. What, you will ask, what have we discovered? What have we concluded? What have we been able to find out about the city? Let's return to the architectural components, because that was one of our major, I would say, discoveries. As I mentioned before, nowhere else in medieval India do we have such a range of architectural evidence for a great city. So I would like to cover some of these different types of architecture. Let's go back to the military type of architecture, the great ramparts. These were actually earthen. They were packed, rammed earth, and the outer surfaces, the outer faces of these great walls, were then faced with great blocks of granite. Granite was available everywhere because of the rocks and boulders. And some of the blocks are enormously long, almost three meters long. And they were fitted together very tightly, ingeniously, but without any mortar. So these earthen walls with granite facings can still be seen today, especially around the urban core where a complete circuit remains. Along the top of the walls was a walkway where soldiers could patrol. And protruding outwards from the walls were these gateways. Each of the gateways was preceded by a walled enclosure, which we call a barbican. And this shielded the actual entrance of the gate. And the passageway through the gate was built in traditional fashion of corbelled stones. Stones that went like this, 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 until the gap was bridged. This is a traditional way of building in South India. These sequences of gateways and walls forms a complete spectrum of military architecture that can still be studied. In addition to the military architecture, we have the traditional way of building in South India, which combines stone with timber and mud or plaster-coated brickwork. All we have left of these buildings are the stone basements. In the royal center of the city, we still have remains of what we call palaces, that is, residences of the emperors, their private household, and the most important nobles. The timber columns, the timber roofs, the tiled tops of the roofs, and the metallic pinnacles, all of these have been lost today. But from the basements, we can still plot the layouts of these palaces. The palaces are symmetrically laid out with ascending levels, like this. So as you go into the palace, you go up, up, and up. And at the topmost point, you have these private chambers. And they're arranged in U formations, like this. So these are the earliest evidences of royal residential architecture. Another important type of building are audience halls, where the kings and the governors and the judges held audience. One of the great audience halls in the royal center of Vijayanagara is what we call the hundred columned hall because there are exactly 100 stone footing blocks on which timber column, columns must have risen. The columns have been burnt and are lost but the plan of the audience hall can still be seen today. It's very tempting to identify this audience hall with one that was described by a Persian visitor to the city in the 1430s. 
He was called Abdul Razak. He came from Herat, which is a town in what is now Afghanistan. And he came from the Timurid Muslim court there on a tour of South India. And he visited Hampi Vijayanagara in the 1430s and wrote about a great audience hall where the king's representative held justice. And possibly this was the structure. Ceremonial structures are also found in the royal centre of Vijayanagara. The most spectacular of these is called the Mahanavami platform because it is linked with the Mahanavami festival. I should tell you a little bit about this great festival that was not invented by the Vijayanagara kings but was spectacularly developed. The Mahanavami or Nine Nights Festival was an occasion held in September October to worship Durga and on this occasion Durga empowered the king's weapons his, and his troops and only after he worshipped Durga could he go on military campaigns but it was very important that he worshipped Durga publicly so he invited all his governors and subordinates throughout the kingdom to come to Hampi for this particular ceremony. Abdul Razak, whom I already mentioned, was also there at the time, and so were the European traders who came to the city at that time. And in order to entertain all of these visitors, the king showed all of his royal elephants, his horses, his military contingents, and his women. So there are great parades, feasts, mock battles, and displays of fireworks and great feasts. These were the most spectacular occasions that were held each year. And they have survived down to the present day in festivals that we know as Dasara, which are still held in some of the kingdoms of northern and southern India, as you may know. Anyhow, there was built at Hampi Vijayanagara, in the royal centre, close to the palaces of the king, a great platform on which, we believe, a temporary shrine was erected each year in September-October, where the king went up to worship Durga with all of the guests and visitors down beneath, looking up at the king. This shrine was probably built of timber, maybe clad in ivory and embellished with jewels. We can only speculate and has, of course, vanished. But the stone basement of the platform survives. And over the years, the platform was raised up in tiers, each year more, more and more. It's solid. It has no chamber inside. And its walls, its outer walls, were embellished with carvings. And these carvings show the activities of the king. They show hunting. They show the king receiving visitors. They show the king with the parades of animals. They show the king with his entertainers. And one of the most interesting scenes show Muslims. It would appear that from very earliest times... Muslims were employed by the Vijayanagara kings in the court and in the cavalry. Muslims were extremely skilled at training horses and leading horse-driven cavalry contingents in the army. And they were welcome at the court. And on the Mahanavami platform, we have depictions of these Muslims with animals. We also have depictions of Muslims with clubs as guardians, also as entertainers playing tambourines. So this is an interesting aspect of courtly life at Hampi Vijayanagara. In the middle of the royal centre of Hampi Vijayanagara is a temple dedicated to Rama. I have already mentioned the Ramayana and the landscape of Hampi. Now, as we know, Rama is one of the most popular deities in India, worshipped widely. Even so, there are very few temples consecrated exclusively to this god. But here we have, in the middle of the city, a Rama temple. 
Evidently, the emperors of Vijayanagara had some affinity with Rama. This is hardly surprising because Rama in mythology is the ideal king, the legendary king who lost his throne and regained it triumphantly and triumphed over evil Ravana. So there was some affinity between the Vijayanagara kings and Rama and they wanted to relate themselves with the landscape and with the legend of Rama. And so they commissioned a magnificent temple to Rama. This was not for the public. This was for their private use. It was like a royal chapel in the middle of their palace area of the royal center of the city. And on the temple walls, they had the complete story. Exactly 108 scenes are there starting with the sacrifice of Dasharatha, the birth of Rama, his youthful exploits, his expulsion and wandering in the forest when he was expelled, the abduction of Sita, the quest of Rama and Lakshmana to find her, the abduction then of Sita by Ravana, and the final battle between Rama and Ravana and the triumphal return to Ayodhya when he was crowned as the rightful king. When we go into the temple, we stand in the middle of the mandapa, the hall in front of the sanctuary where the images were worshipped, and we look out of the doorways, out into the landscape. We see the summits of several of the hills around the royal center. We see Matanga Hill, which is connected with the Kishkinda chapter, we see Malyavanta Hill, which is believed to be where Rama and Lakshmana waited while Hanuman went off in search of Sita. In this way, the temple is related to the landscape of the city. So there is a sort of correlation between mythological landscape and urban landscape. The temple is connected with the surroundings. The temple stands in a compound with high walls and on the outer surfaces of these walls are other carvings. These do not show the Ramayana. In fact, these don't show anything mythological or legendary. They show the parades of the Mahanavami. It's extremely interesting. They proclaim the royal quality of this shrine. So we have parades of elephants. We have parades of horses. We have different milit military contingents wearing different costumes, bearing different weapons, and then we have dancing girls. And what is extremely interesting for us is that in the parades of horses, there are depictions of Arabs. The horses are not being ridden. It's not a parade of horse riders. It's a parade of horses, because horses were very much sought after by the Vijayanagara kings and the ownership of horses was one way of showing their imperial status. The problem was that in southern India, horses didn't do very well, they didn't breed very effectively. There was a constant source of need to bring horses from outside India. And this was one of the chief trading exports from the Arabian Peninsula to the west coast of India, among them Goa, horses were brought by Arab seafarers and then transported up through the Ghats to Hampi Vijayanagara. And in the early 15th century, when the Rama temple was built, it was Arabs who brought these horses to Vijayanagara. After the turn of the 16th century, the Portuguese had captured the trade of the Arabian Sea. They had ousted the Arabs and the horse trade was then in the hands of the Portuguese. So in the later art of Vijayanagara we find Portuguese people leading the horses. And in fact these Portuguese horse traders were very welcome at Hampi especially during the Mahanavami. And two of the most vivid accounts of life at Vijayanagara are by Nunes and Paez, two horse traders who were at Hampi in the 16th century and left their accounts of their visits. 
These were published, of course, well after their deaths, translated into French, and now available in English, and they make for the most entertaining and insightful reading. Returning to the architecture of the Royal Centre, I've mentioned already the military architecture of the urban core, I've mentioned the palaces, audience hall and Mahanavami of the Royal Centre. There exists another category of architecture which is unique to Hampi Vijayanagara and is partly explained by contact with the Muslim kingdoms to the north. Now, while the Vijayanagara kings were always warring in aggressive relationship to the, the sultans of Gulbarga and Bid Bidar, the relationship was not always negative. There must have always been interchanges of people and ideas. And this is seen in the architecture of Vijayanagara, especially the royal centre. I've already mentioned that Muslims were present at the city and were welcome. Devaraya, too, apparently even kept a Quran next to his throne so he could take the oaths of his Muslim cavalry officers. And various mosques and tombs in and around the city show that there were wealthy and influential Muslims who made their home in Vijayanagara. Now the Vijayanagara kings were very anxious to have an image that was universal and cosmopolitan. And they decided that some, for some of their structures, their elephant stables, their meeting halls, their pleasure pavilions, they wanted to build in a Muslim style, or let's say a sultanate style. This type of architecture is completely different to anything else that I have talked about so far. It was built entirely of masonry, that is rubble, rubble rocks, rubble bricks, and finished off with nicely coated plaster, which gave a very nice finish. These buildings had pointed arches like this, or they had arches with lobes like this. They had various types of vaults and domes inside. The result is, because they were built of masonry, they have survived more or less intact to the present day. So while buildings which had timbers have been burnt and lost, buildings built altogether in masonry, like this sultanate type of architecture, have been preserved better. Now, we hesitate to call this type of architecture Muslim because it's hybrid. It uses elements from temples as well as elements from sultanate architecture. It's a sort of mix. It's a courtly architecture because it's used only in the royal centre, or let's say mostly in the royal centre. One of the most famous buildings at Hampi is the Lotus Mahal. This is a, an audience hall, not built for the queens, as popularly understood, but probably for the kings to meet with their commanders. It's near to the military, elephant stables and the parade grounds. The Lotus Mahal has arches which are of this type. They derive from sultanate Muslim architecture. But it's topped with temple-like towers, which are pyramidal. So it's a sort of hybrid between temple-type architecture and sultanate architecture. A short distance away are the elephant stables, and these are the most amazing building because they are enormously long. They have 11 chambers, each of which could have accommodated one or perhaps two elephants. Now, you must understand, these were not everyday stables. The elephants must have been accommodated on the outskirts of the city where there was plenty of greenery for which they depended and had to eat. These were places where elephants were displayed on particular ceremonial occasions, maybe a couple of times a year. And the stables are roofed with domes and vaults. And in the middle, at the upper level, is a chamber for musicians and drummers to beat the time for the elephants to be paraded. And in front of the elephant stables is a big parade ground, what we would call in India a Maidan. Now it's planted like a garden, but originally it was an earthen area where troops and elephants and horses could be paraded. And the other side of the ground is a sort of grandstand, a place where the king, the Vijayanagara emperor, and the nobles could sit and watch the parades. And inside this building is a place where mock battles and fights 
could take place. So very much a male part of the city, not at all a place where the women would have congregated. Other structures within the royal centre built in this style, with Muslim or Sultanate influences, is the Queen's Bath. This has a pool, now no longer with water, with balconies overlooking it, where the nobles could sit, they could enjoy themselves looking at perhaps the women bathing in the pool. Watchtowers were required in this part of the city because privacy was extremely important and there are square and octagonal watchtowers looking down onto these private parts of the palace. And each of these buildings was contained within a compound bounded by high walls and the walls tapered like this. They were very, very thin. They were not for protection against invasion, they were protection against viewing, they were private barriers. Other structures within the royal centre are pleasure pavilions and towers and fountains and water pavilions. There are a lot of these types of structures in this hybrid style. So this range of architecture is unique and for people like myself who are interested in studying architecture and the students that we had, they had a great deal of fun mapping and measuring these various structures. And we cannot find such structures from the 14th, 15th and 16th centuries anywhere else in a Hindu royal city. Coming now to the temples. I've already mentioned the sacred center of the city in which great temples were built. Now, over the 200 years of the history of the city, temple architecture changed. The earliest temples, like those built in and around Hampi on Hemakuta Hill, are in a very different style to the later temples. The earlier temples are built entirely of granite and they had small pyramidal roofs, like this, built of granite with horizontal divisions. This was a way of building that was fashionable in this part of India from the 11th and 12th centuries on. So on Hemakuta Hill, which is the hill that rises above Hampi, we will find many temples like this, as well as gateways and light lamp columns, dipastambas. So this is the early type of temple architecture. When we come to the 15th century, as in the Rama temple in the middle of the royal center, we start to get a different style of architecture, partly coming from the Tamil zone, which was a land which was brought under the control of the Vijayanagara emperors. Temple towers are no longer built like pyramids, they're built in the Dravida style, which is like this, this and this, multi-storied and built of brick and plaster which was lighter and quicker to build, but of course hasn't lasted as well. The lower parts of the temples were entirely of granite. They had basement moldings, horizontal moldings like this, and they were divided into bays by pilasters. So this is the southern Indian style of architecture. And an example from the 15th century is the Rama temple. In the 16th century, under the Tulavas, especially Krishna Devaraya, who is one of the most famous of the Vijayanagara emperors, temple architecture starts to evolve. It gets grander. We would like to call it imperial, larger and much more impressive. To begin with, temples are entered through these great gopuras that I have already mentioned earlier. These towered gateways were brought from Tamil Nadu to Vijayanagara. They were not known in the Vijayanagara area of Karnataka prior to the 16th century. So it was a type of architecture that the Vijayanagara emperors commissioned to be brought to the capital and to be erected there. And you may ask, why did they bring such an architecture to Vijayanagara? I would like to suggest because this was an architecture that was grand. It was imperial in scale. They used it to convey their great wealth and power. And also, what was interesting about gopuras, you could construct gopuras in front of earlier temples that you had not built, but that you wanted to sort of appropriate. And this is what happened throughout the Vijayanagara Empire. 
as the Vijayanagara kings invested in temples all over their kingdom, in what is now Andhra, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, they erected gopuras, which were a mark of their imperial status. If you go to the great temple centers of southern India, Kanchipuram, Chidambaram, for example, you will find gopuras that were appropriated by the Vijayanagara kings. At Chidambaram, there are even portrait sculptures of Krishna Devaraya commemorating his visit to the temple. And at Hampi Vijayanagara, all of the great puras that I mentioned have temples with great gopuras. They were built in front of the Virupaksha temple at Hampi, in front of the Balakrishna temple, the Tiruvengalanata temple, often known as Achuttaraya's temple, and the Vitala temple. Once you went into the temple, you entered the main building through a mandapa or pillared columned hall. And these halls became showpieces of granite carving and architecture. Instead of having just simple columns with brackets, these columns started to have cut out colonnettes attached to them. So you had the shaft and then tiny little colonnettes around them. Extremely complicated to cut out. Then the columns started to have animals attached to them. So you had the shaft of the column and then a leaping animal. And these leaping animals were a bit like lions, but they were fantastic beasts. And they were known in South India as yalis. And in the Virupaksha temple and in the Vitala temple, we have many mandapas with yali columns. And many of these yali columns are ridden not by gods and goddesses, but by warriors. So it's an extremely martial, military element that enters into temple architecture and art. And these are very impressive carvings. They're carved with great naturalism, and it's very interesting to notice that the warriors wear different costumes. Some of them are traditional Indian warriors. Some of them have beards, funny hats, and slippers, and they look like the Muslims. They were obviously Muslim officers in the military contingents of the Vijayanagara army. And some of them even have costumes that look vaguely European, because we know that Portuguese were also employed as mercenaries in the Vijayanagara army. So this should give you an idea of the cosmopolitan quality of courtly life and military life at Vijayanagara. In many books that you will read, you will get the impression that Vijayanagara was a Hindu outpost that fought against the Muslims in the Deccan. And it's a sort of black and white reading of history, Hindu versus Muslim. The reading of the architecture and the culture of Hampi Vijayanagara reveals a much more nuanced, subtle, more interesting story. These were kingdoms in which different cultures intermingled to create a hybrid culture. It's not only true in Hampi Vijayanagara, it was also true in Gulbarga and Bida and the later sultanates of the Deccan. Both of these cultures adjusted to each other. They interacted with each other and they had for many years a very uneasy, but no doubt, coexistence. So at Hampi Vijayanagara we're dealing with a culture that adjusted to the sultanate intrusion into southern India. The architecture reveals a crossover between Muslim and traditional Hindu cultures. Muslims were present, employed and valued in the Vijayanagara army and at the Vijayanagara court. Meanwhile, Hindus were valued and employed at the Muslim courts. Europeans also make an appearance in the 16th century, not only bringing valuable horses, but firearms as well, and their accounts of ancient Vijayanagara still remain as the most vivid chronicles that we have. Vijayanagara today is a protected site. It requires two or three days of touring. All of you should be encouraged to visit the site because no amount of photography or graphic accounts of the mapping can give a proper reading of the experience of the site. 
Nobody will ever forget the experience of being there. It always remains in the memory as one of the most haunting and magnificent vestiges of a culture that was wiped out with this incredible destruction. But enough is there to be seen, to be appreciated, to marvel at the ruins. So please make the visit to Vijayanagara so that you too can wonder at what was the city of victory.